Well, good morning, Perry Creek Church family. We are so glad that you have chosen to come and worship with us. If you were able, let's stand together and sing as we worship together.
Well, good morning and welcome to Perry Creek. My name is Mary Green and I'm a member here. And we are so glad that you have tuned in to join us today, whether you are a regular member or, or just a member. I get, we don't have like elevation to members. Whether you're a member or a regular attender, or if it's just your first time joining for church, we're so glad that you're here this morning. And as I stated, and you probably already realized, this isn't my regular gig. I'm, I'm just a member. And so when John um, asked me to do this, he called me about midweek kind of see like, have you read the scriptures or something I can do for you, make sure you don't mess up. Um, but he also said, you know, knowing you, we really expect some props. We expect some props. So I was like, you know, when the pastor calls, you go, okay, sure. You know, like they said, you want to lead liturgical dance, play the tambourine on your head, sure, pastor, anything you want. So I said, yes, okay. Um, but now in front of these millions of viewers or however many we have out there, um, I have a confession to make. I have the gift of sarcasm. Props are not my thing. I'm not a prop, propism, propping, it's, it's not my thing. So because you know, props are corny and props are cheesy. And I'm not really sure they help you get your point across. So I pulled out all of my resolve and determined that I'm just not gonna use props. I just, I'm not sure what they're gonna help. But you know, you did not tune in to hear about what I, gifts I have or I don't have. Um, you tuned in to hear what God is saying to you today and to sing some praises to him. So I am excited to tell you that we're starting a new sermon series today, and the sermon series is called Resolve. Um, so I did have to spend a bit of time this week thinking about resolve. It, is, it can be used as a noun, as a verb. It's a, an action or a thing. Um, and so if you want, um, see, now I really, or not. this isn't my regular gig, and this isn't flat. Um, so when, you th when I think about resolve, I think that it takes, you know, a little effort because it's being determined, like you might resolve um, to really finish that race, to make it up that hill, or you might resolve to uh, resolve a conflict, but it involves a little bit of grit, a little bit of determination, just like, for example, if you drop something on your carpet and you can just pick it up, you pick it up, but if you have to pull out the resolve and spray it, then you have to put a little more effort into it. And so as we look into the book of Acts, if you don't know much about Acts, it's really um, God's first round draft pick to spread the gospel. He's like, I want the word to get out, and you guys are the ones to do it. And so it takes a lot of resolve on their part. They have to kind of dig in, do some things that are not really easy. And so, um, you know, I figure we as Christians also want to think, what do we need to resolve to? What do we need to do? What do we need to look at? And who better to look at than these guys in Acts to see what their resolve is? But before um, John comes up and teaches us what the Bible has to say about resolve, he's going to come up and lead us in a time of prayer. Thanks, Mary. I think. Just kidding. Uh, we're going to take a moment today to just pray about our church having a place to meet. And uh, you know, much, much of the time when I pray, I don't have notes, but today I'm gonna read a prayer that I wrote and I want us to all lift this up together to the Lord. So join me in prayer. Lord, you've always been good to Perry Creek Church. You have provided our needs. You have given us wonderful people. You have given us a wonderful spirit as a church. And Lord, you've provided us enough to share. And Lord, you've always provided us a place to meet. You know, I remember your original provision of a place to meet. That was an important part of our call to start Perry Creek Church. And Lord, I remember when you called us to River Bend Elementary School. I remember the foolishness of me worrying about whether people would leave because of the folding chairs. <laughs> but they didn't, Lord. And River Bend is exactly where we needed to be because you had some hard work to do on our congregation. You wanted us to develop a heart for serving the community. And what I'm saying is, Lord, you've always been faithful. And you're faithful now. 
Father, we are so grateful that through the generosity of Open Door, we have a safe, comfortable place to meet in that's rent-free. You know, at a time, Lord, when many churches are paying for buildings that they're not using, we're using a building that we're not paying for. So thank you. Lord, you've also always been faithful. It's, it's, it's you that's been faithful. It's not our wisdom. It's not you know, our strength. It's not our resources. It's you. And Lord, we trust that you're going to continue to provide for your church. And Lord, as we look forward to the time when we're going to be able to meet together again, as we anticipate the moment, when we can gather, not just a few of us, Lord, but when we can gather in mass, and Father, when we can serve the community, we look forward to that time. And, and Father, as we think about that time, we long for a space. Father, we long for a space where we can worship you, a space where we can serve one another, a space where we can serve the community. Father, we long to have a space that is an outpost for the gospel. L Lord, a place that can be a beachhead for your kingdom. And, and, and Lord, we want that space to be your space. Father, we want it to be the space that you provided, not because we got impatient, not because we whined and complained, but because it was your delight to give it to us, because that was your best plan for us. And so, Lord, we pray as we pray about a space that you would guide our prayers. Lord, we pray that we would not ask for too much. Father, we pray that we would not be strapped with a building that distracts us, that is a weight on our shoulders and distracts us from the ministry that you've called us to. And Lord, we pray that we would not ask for too little. Father, help us not to underestimate your ability to provide for us and your desire to provide for us. So, Father, our desire is to have a space that can be a base of operations for the gospel. Lord, we pray that you would provide that. Father, we ask for room for us to grow in our worship and in our ministries. Father, we would love for that space to be in a community that we can serve. Lord, a community that you have prepared us to serve, a community that needs a church like Perry Creek. And Father, we would like for that space to be seven days a week. But Lord, if we're not ready for that, Lord, if, if, if you need us to wait a little while, if our story at Riverbend isn't finished, if you're building something for us or you're wanting to build something in us, then, Father, it will be our great delight to wait and to be wherever you call us to be. And, Lord, we promise we'll say that you're good because you are. Wherever you want us to meet, Lord, you're good. Only make your will clear for us. And, Father, we will praise you we will worship you, and we will serve you. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Well, let's continue worshiping as we sing together. Sustain 
was an amazing man. 
If you've never heard of Lee Iacocca, he's the guy who basically invented the Mustang for Ford, a great invention. (laughs) And he's the guy who rescued Chrysler from bankruptcy in the 80s. He was an amazing guy. And he had a lot of memorable sayings. So Lee Iacocca said, trouble shared is trouble halved. That's a great saying. (laughs) He once said, people want economy and they'll pay any price to get it. But one of the most memorable things that Lee Iacocca said was this, in life, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And we would agree with that, right? I mean, if you're running a company like Lee Iacocca did, it's important to keep the main thing the main thing. Well, let me say that what's true of Chrysler is also true of the church. You know, in the church, we have to keep the main thing the main thing. So what is the main thing? You know, is it the kind of music that we listen to? Because we love our music, right? Is that it? Is the main thing the network that we belong to? We love the pillar network. Is that it? Is it where we meet or when we meet? We just spent some time praying about that. Is the main thing our discipleship pathway? We just spent three weeks going over our discipleship pathway. So that's important. But what is the main thing here at Perry Creek? Well, here at Perry Creek, the main thing is the gospel, right? The good news, this wonderful message that God has sent his son Jesus into the world and that through Jesus we can have forgiveness and and a relationship with God and we can have meaning in the now and we can have eternity with God in the future. That message, the gospel, is our main thing at Perry Creek. It's the message that drives everything that we do. And today we're going to look at a fascinating Bible story that sort of shows us how important, how precious the gospel message really is. And we're going to talk about why it's the main thing here at Perry Creek. So actually today, let me just say, we are starting a new sermon series. This series is the next leg in our recurring study of the book of Acts. And, you know, we started our study of Acts a few years ago with a sermon series called Launch, where we saw God move powerfully through the church in Acts chapters 1 to 7. And that was a very timely series for us because our church was launching. So launch, right? And then we you know, continued our study of Acts last spring with a series called Pivot. This was a series from Acts chapters 8 to 12 where we saw God call his church to pivot, to change. He, He called the church to change from incoming to outgoing. He called the church to change from welcoming saints to welcoming sinners. And he called the church to change from being a church of one Jewish culture to a church of many cultures. And that was also a timely series for us because I don't know if you agree with me, but I would say if, if, if there's one thing that we experienced in 2020, it was the need to pivot, the need to change, right? Well, today we're going to start the third leg of our journey in Acts. And this leg will cover Acts chapters 13 to 15. And if you know the story of Acts, that includes Paul's first missionary journey, and it includes a meeting called the Jerusalem Council. And we've decided to call this series Resolve for a couple of reasons. First of all, in this part of the book, the apostles have to have resolve to carry out the difficult task of the first missionary journey. So they're going to face difficulty, and they have to have resolve. And then secondly, we're calling it resolve because in this part of the book, the church has to resolve the issue of whether we are saved by believing in the gospel or whether we're saved by the commands of the Old Testament. So see what I did there, right? Two, two meanings for the, you know, the have, have resolve. and re- Anyway, okay, so this series is called Resolve, and, and I've got to be honest, I'm just a little bit nervous about preaching this 
Because if the other two series were timely, I'm wondering how this series about, you know, determination amidst toughness and hardship is going to be timely. So we'll see. Maybe I should have done a series called Prosper or Relax. I don't know. But it's Resolve, and we're going to start it today, okay? I'm resolved to that. All right. And as we start it, we're going to look at a story that, like I said, is a fascinating story about a guy named Elimus and the importance of the gospel. And today, as we look at this, we're just going to do a couple of things. First of all, we're just going to walk through the story uh, just to understand what happened on this first step of Paul's first missionary journey. And then secondly, we're just going to talk about three ways that the story applies to us. Three things we should know or do in light of the importance of the gospel. So let's just read our story. It's found in Acts chapter 13, if you want to turn there, Acts chapter 13, verses 4 to 12, and just to kind of bring you up to speed on where we're at in the book of Acts. So the early church has been launched after Jesus' resurrection, that they have made the pivots that God called for, so they're ready to reach out and share the gospel with both Jews and non-Jewish Gentiles. That The Holy Spirit has called two guys, a guy named Barnabas and a guy named Paul, to do that. And now as we come to verse 4 of chapter 13, they are embarking on their very first missionary journey. So Luke begins the story like this. The two of them, that is Paul and Barnabas, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John, that is John Mark, Barnabas' nephew, was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, Lord, we are desperate for you to speak. Father, your word implanted in us, your word given to us by your spirit is our daily bread. And so, Father, we ask that you would speak today as we look at this passage. Lord, as, as I studied the passage, you know, this week it seemed in some ways so complex. It seemed to go in so many different directions. But, Lord, it's really simple. It's about the gospel. Father, that's what we have to be about as a church. That has to guide the words that are spoken from this pulpit. That has to guide our our efforts. That has to guide our property search. And so, Father, as we just look at a passage about the gospel, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, this is not a, a sermon where I'm telling people many, many things that they need to do. And so, Father, this is a moment where we are dependent on you to apply the word to our hearts. So, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would have free reign, just as you did with Paul. I pray that you would have free reign as we look at your word now. So, Lord, please speak to us and be glorified. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. 
So like I said, the first thing that we want to look at today is the story of our passage. And the story is this, God deals with someone who blocks the gospel. God deals with someone who blocks the gospel. So as our story begins, a guy named Barnabas, who we met in Acts chapter 5, and a guy named Saul, who is also called Paul, get together and they are headed out on the first short-term missions trip in the history of the world. Okay, this is the very first one. So they're ready to share the gospel. So they go to the coast and they take a ship to the island of Cyprus, the same country that we call Cyprus today. It's the third largest island in the Mediterranean. It was a melting pot of cultures. It had a large population of Jewish people, and it was Barnabas's home turf, all of which made it the perfect place for Paul and Barnabas to start. So they sailed to the near side of the island. They they preached in a few synagogues, and then they walked about 90 miles across Cyprus to the capital city of Paphos. And that's where the trouble started. So they met a man there who tried to block the sharing of the gospel. Look at what Luke says, the writer of Acts. Luke says in verses 6 and 7, he says this, They traveled throughout the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Okay, so Luke tells us that at Paphos, Paul and Barnabas met two interesting characters. First, there's a guy with one of the weirdest names you will ever hear, okay? The NIV calls him Bar-Jesus, and I can't decide whether that sounds more like a Christian dude ranch we're wrestling cattle down at the bar of Jesus, or whether it sounds more like a Christian candy bar. Okay, but in Hebrew, the name actually has a meaning. In Hebrew, bar means son of. So Simon bar Jonah means Simon, son of Jonah. And Jesus, or Yeshua, or Joshua, they're all the same thing in Hebrew, okay? That was actually a very common name in New Testament times. So there's probably no literal connection between Jesus Christ, our our Jesus, and this guy who is called the son of Jesus or son of Yeshua. And, And then Luke goes on to tell us several other things about this guy. So first of all, he was Jewish. He was one of God's chosen people, right? So he was a Jew. And living on an island like Cyprus, where there had a large Jewish population, he would have known the God of the Bible. He would have known the right way. But he didn't live the right way. Because the second thing that Luke tells us about this guy is that he was a sorcerer. He is what Luke calls a a magus or or a magi. Same word as the wise men in Matthew, okay? So, in fact, Luke tells us that in another language, this guy's name, his other name, Alemus, means sorcerer. So this guy used black magic. Now, the third thing that Luke tells us about him is that he was a false prophet. In other words, he didn't just do magic tricks. He probably combined his Jewish heritage with his sorcery to sort of claim that he could predict the future. And that's probably the basis for the last thing that we hear about this man. And that that is that he was in some official capacity connected to the ruler of of Cyprus. He was an advisor to this political leader. Okay, so there's this Jewish sorcerer, false prophet, advisor guy named Bar Jesus or Alemus, right? And then secondly, Luke tells us that there was a government official. So Luke gives us this guy's official title, which was proconsul. That's like a, a, a governor that was appointed by the Senate. And then Luke gives us his name, which is Sergius Paulus. All right, so let me just say between um, Saul and Paul and Alemus and Bar-Jesus and Sergius Paulus, there's a whole lot of names to keep track of here, all right? But there's actually only three main characters in this story that we have to keep track of, all right? So there's Paul, there's Alemus, the sorcerer, and then there's Sergius Paulus, who we'll call the governor. All right, now the governor, who, who Luke tells us was an intelligent or learned man, had this Jewish sorcerer advising him. But 
apparently he had questions about the advice that he was being given because when he heard about the gospel, he summoned Paul and Barnabas because he wanted to hear it. But Alemus didn't like that. He probably thought that he was going to lose his place of influence if this governor turned to the real Jesus instead of bar Jesus, okay? So look at what Luke tells us in verse 8. He says, but Alemus the sorcerer, for that is what his name is, means opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Okay, so Luke doesn't tell us exactly what Alemus did, but he does tell us that he actively, the word is a very active word, he actively opposed Paul and Barnabas. So maybe he did some sort of magic or, you know, he definitely tried to discredit them. But whatever it was, he not only refused the gospel for himself, but he tried to prevent the governor from believing as well. Paul's response to that was immediate and intense. Look at what Luke says in verses 9 to 11. He says, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Alemus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Wow. That sounds harsh. <laughs> and it is pretty harsh, right? I mean, Paul responds to this resistance, first of all, by just telling Alemus how the cow ate the cabbage, right? He doesn't debate with him. He doesn't have a miracle contest. He just tells Alemus exactly who he is. You said, he says, you are a son of of the devil. You're not bar Jesus, you are bar Satan. That's literally what he would have said. And you're opposed to everything that's right. Then Paul says, look, you're not a prophet, you're full of deceit and trickery. And, and lastly, Paul says, you pervert, you twist the ways of the Lord. You, you pervert what you know to be true, all because you want to hold on to your little position of power. Right? And then having declared who Alemus is, Paul is moved by the Holy Spirit to tell Alemus exactly what God is going to do about this. He says the hand of God is against you and for a time you're going to be unable to see the light of the sun. In other words, your physical condition is going to reflect your spiritual condition. It's about to get really, really dark. And then in the second half of verse 11, Luke describes the result of Paul's response. He says, immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. So Alemus experiences the judgment that Paul pronounces on him. He, the person who has been leading people into darkness, experiences darkness. And in an ironic twist, he seeks for somebody to lead him. But the story isn't over yet. There's still one more person who responds to the situation. Look at what Luke says in verse 12. He says, when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So when Sergius Paulus saw what happened to this false prophet and apparently powerful magician, he decided he'd better go ahead and listen to the teaching of the Lord. And when he heard the gospel... He was amazed at the teaching about Jesus, and he believed. Okay, so that's the story of Alemus and Sergius Paulus and the Apostle Paul. That's the story of how God dealt with Alemus when he tried to block the gospel. Now we need to ask ourselves, how does that relate to you and me? Right? Why did Luke choose to share this story with his readers? What impact does he want it to have on our lives well I think there are three applications of this story three points where it connects with our lives so let me just give them to you one at a time um, the, the first application is just this the gospel is the main thing the gospel is the main thing you know, we started this sermon by saying we have to keep the main thing, the main thing, and what's true in, in, in church 
is also true in life. We have to keep the main thing the main thing, and the first thing we see in this passage is that the gospel is the main thing. So let me explain what I mean, because you might not see that when you just read the passage. You, you know, when we first look at this passage, we might be tempted to think that the main thing is judgment, right? I mean, it is sort of a judgy passage, right? You know, Luke tells us that Elimus is a bad guy and then he does a bad thing and then he gets called a child of the devil and he gets stricken blind. So that's pretty judgy, right? So when we first look at this passage, we might think that judgment is the main thing. But it's not. In this passage, it's actually the gospel that's the main thing. It's the gospel that is the larger story here. I mean, think with me for a minute. You know, the, the backdrop of the story is the gospel, right? The reason that they're on Cyprus is so that they can proclaim the gospel. And the occasion of the story is the gospel. This whole story happens because Sergius Paulus invites Paul and Barnabas to come and talk to him about the gospel. So it's the occasion, and the gospel is the punchline of the story. You know, the climax, the conclusion of the story is that Sergius Paulus believes the gospel. Notice that Luke doesn't say he became a believer because of the miracle he saw. He says he became a believer because he was amazed at the teaching about Jesus. So this is all about the gospel. In fact, I even think that the judgment here is about the gospel. You know, I wondered as I studied this passage, why is Luke telling us this story and pointing out that God judged Elimus so harshly, right? I, I wondered that. You know, I'm like, can I tell people they're going to go blind if they irritate me? <laughs> why is he telling us this? And it, here's the thing. If you read the book of Acts, Paul experienced a lot of resistance, Right, This isn't the only time. He was persecuted in 12 cities by my count, and he experienced things that were a lot worse than this. Right, He was mobbed, he was beaten, he, he was uh, imprisoned, he was stoned and left for dead. He experienced things that were a lot worse than just somebody doing a magic trick and discrediting him. Right, But this is the only time that Paul pronounces judgment on someone like this. So, so why does God deal with this so harshly? And, and why is Luke telling us about it? Well, as I read the book of Acts, I think Luke is telling us this story because there's a lot more going on here than just one guy trying to discredit Paul. You see, this story is it's a metaphor. It's an illustration. It's a snapshot of something that's happening in a larger arena. You know, in this story, we have a, a, a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, somebody who's far from God, an outsider to the ways of God, who is hungry to hear the good news about Jesus, right? He's asking for it. He's ready. And in this story, we have a Jew who is desperately trying to prevent that from happening. You know, this guy's running interference. He's resisting. He's trying to block the gospel because he's afraid that he's going to lose his place. So Elimus thinks that, look, if the governor responds to the simplicity and forgiveness of the gospel, he thinks that he's going to lose his you know, status as spiritual advisor. He thinks that he'll no longer be the religious power broker in the situation. And see, that's a snapshot of the exact thing that's going to happen again and again in the book of Acts. You know, through the, the rest of Acts, you have Gentiles that are hungry to receive the gospel, and you have Jews that are trying to block it again and again because they're afraid that they're going to lose their status as spiritual advisors. I mean, that's literally what the religious leaders of Israel said about Jesus right before they crucified him. They said, if we don't deal with this guy, we're going to lose our place and our nation. And, you know, as we read the rest of the book of Acts and as we read the New Testament and, and, and Paul's writings, we can see that God dealt with the majority of Israel in the same way that he is dealing with Elimus. He gave them spiritual blindness. 
He said, if you like darkness, I'm, I'm going to give it to you. You know, Jesus said that darkness was going to overtake Israel. John said they had been blinded. Paul says in his writings that a hardening came on Israel with respect to the gospel. So they were unable to see the truths and they were removed from the situation, from the spiritual equation. And you know, this didn't just happen because they sinned. Or, or because, they, you know, this didn't just happen to Elimus because he was mean to Paul. It happened because of the gospel. You know, Israel was blocking those who were hungry for the word of God from hearing the gospel. And guys, if there's one thing that Luke wants us to know from this passage and from the story of Acts, it's that God is so passionate about people having a chance to hear the gospel. He's so passionate about people having a chance to know him and have life in his son that he'll remove whatever gets in the way right he'll remove people like Alemus if they get in the way he will remove nations even his chosen nation if they get in the way he will remove churches if they lose sight of the gospel and get in the way you know, there's this scene in the book of Revelation where Jesus is walking amongst the churches and they're portrayed as lamps and he talks about extinguishing the lamp of those churches that lose their first love in the gospel. So listen, my point is just this. The gospel is the main thing. It's the main thing in this story. It's the main thing in God's story with humanity. And it has to be the main thing at Perry Creek and, and in our lives. Right, guys, the gospel has to be our primary message at Perry Creek. Not self-help, not rules and regulations. The gospel. The gospel has to be the thing that drives our missions work. You know, everything that we do in missions has to be done with an eye to sharing the gospel. It's the gospel that's got to drive our search for property, right? Who cares whether we're comfortable? Is that really what it's all about? It's about the gospel, right? The gospel has to energize our discipleship pathway. That, that's what it's all about. And, and, and the gospel pattern that you've heard me mention before, I see my sin, I name my sin, I find grace for my sin, I share grace with others. That has to be the pattern of our relationships at Perry Creek. So listen, the first thing that we learn from this passage is that the gospel is the main thing. Now, the second thing that we learn from the passage is this. Don't block the gospel. Okay? Don't block the gospel, or to say it another way, don't bar Jesus, right? That was for Mary Green. I've been storing that up all week. Anyway, okay, um, but seriously, don't block the gospel, right? You, you know, as we look at this story in, in this passage, not only are we supposed to see the connection between Elemus and Israel, but we're also supposed to ask ourselves if there's a connection between Elemus and us. You know, we're supposed to look at Alemus and ask ourselves, is, is that me in some sense? Am I, you know, playing the role of Alemus? Am I blocking the gospel? And when I say this, I don't just mean are we doing sorcery or are we speaking against people who are sharing the gospel. Guys, there are lots of ways to block the gospel. You know, we block the gospel when we show contempt rather than God's love for those who need the gospel. That blocks their hearing of the gospel. Right? We block the gospel when we live in hypocrisy. When we preach one thing and, and live another, it blocks the gospel. You, you may have heard the uh, quote, or there was a famous quote from Mahatma Gandhi, who was a civil rights activist and a Hindu. He one time said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And, and what Mahatma Gandhi was saying in his own way is your hypocrisy blocks the gospel. So we can do it that way. We can block the gospel by not speaking up. Right? You know, the gospel is a message. It has to be spoken. And there are times when God calls us to share our faith with others, but there are times when we don't speak up, right? Right? 
times when we kind of think maybe we should say something, but we don't because maybe like Elimus, we're afraid that we're going to lose our place. So we keep quiet and we block the gospel. We can also block the gospel in our lone lives and in the lives of others with our pride. And when we're too proud to admit that we were wrong and that we need to change, when we hurt people and we don't engage in that gospel pattern because we're too proud, it blocks the gospel. Okay, so listen, this passage encourages us to ask ourselves, am I blocking the gospel in some way? And it reminds us that God doesn't take kindly to that. Okay, so number one, the gospel is the main thing. Number two, don't block the gospel. Now, there's one more application that I see from this passage, and it's this. Remember, there's always hope in the gospel. Remember that there's always hope in the gospel. You know, this story does seem to be about judgment when we first read it, right? I mean, we read, when you first read it, you're like, whoa, this feels harsh, right? But here's the thing. It actually contains a reminder of the hope of the gospel, not just for Sergius Paulus, but for people like Alemus as well. This passage shows us the hope of the gospel. Because not only were we meant to see Alemus' similarity to Israel, you know, not only were we meant to ask if he's similar to us, but listen, in this passage, we are meant to see Alemus' similarity to someone else. Someone else who is in this story. You know, if we were reading the book of Acts for the first time and we were reading through it, when Paul pronounces sentence on Alemus and says to him, you're going to be blind for a time and unable to see, and when they have to lead Alemus out by the hand, if we've been reading the book of Acts, we are immediately reminded of someone else. And that's Paul himself, right? You know, Paul was a gospel blocker like Alemus. In fact, Paul was worse than Alemus. He didn't just try to convince people not to listen to the gospel. Paul actually persecuted and murdered Christians. And and there came a time when God imposed on Paul the exact same judgment that Paul is pronouncing on Alemus here. You know, in Acts chapter 9, uh, Luke says this, Paul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind. And see, when we read this story, we're meant to think of that story. We're meant to remember that although Paul faced God's judgment, he ultimately found the gospel and came to live in God's forgiveness. And we're meant to know that God's forgiveness can reach people, not just like Barnabas or Sergius Paulus. It can reach people like Paul and Elemus. And it's not just for people in Bible times. It can also reach people like you and me. And, And we're meant to remember that in the gospel, there's always hope. No matter how far gone somebody seems to be, maybe you have somebody in your life that you, they, they always resist the gospel. They're not too far gone. Maybe it's you. Maybe you're going, I'm so far from God. There's so much hypocrisy in my life. I don't think I'll ever get back to where God loves me. Listen, there's hope for you in the gospel. We're meant to remember there's always hope. In fact, Paul would later write this about the nation of Israel who are judged like Alemus is judged. Remember that he said that Israel had become blinded. But listen to what Paul says in Romans 11. When he's talking about Israel, he says this, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come to faith. And then all Israel will be saved. Listen, there's always hope in the gospel. And that's why the gospel is the main thing in this passage. And that's why it's the main thing at Perry Creek. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we think about this passage... 
Uh, Lord, there are times when we could probably put ourselves in the place of many of the people in this passage. Maybe there are times when we feel like a Sergius Paulus and we're curious about the gospel and we want to learn more. Maybe there are times when we're trying to minister like Paul and Barnabas. Or maybe there are times when we're like Alenus. When we just resist your work in our lives because we think we're going to lose power. Father, I pray that we would turn again and again to you in the form of the gospel. Lord, help us to know that what you give us in the gospel is for our good, it's for our healing, it's for our life. And Father, may that be the guiding factor in our church. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, church family, thank you so much for spending time with us today. You know, one thing you're going to figure out pretty quickly as you hang around Perry Creek Church is that church for us is so much more than just what happens on a Sunday. Church for us here at Perry Creek is living out the gospel in our daily lives, living it out, keeping the main thing, the main thing in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in whatever place we find ourselves, keeping the gospel the main thing and living out our faith through service. And one way that we can do that together as a church is coming up on February the 20th. That's a Saturday. And from 1 to 4 p.m., the missions team is going to be heading out to the food bank of Eastern and Central North Carolina. Now, this is the food bank that supplies Riverbend Elementary School and our Perry Creek community. So it's very dear to our hearts. And when we get there, we're going to do whatever they need us to do. We don't know exactly what it's going to be. It could be boxing up canned goods. It could be accepting donations. It might even be sorting through rotten produce. We don't know what they're going to ask us to do or what they're going to need us to do on that day, but we're going to be ready to do it. And we have 10 slots reserved for people who would like to go with us. So we don't know what it's going to be like exactly, but we do know that it's going to be a great time to live out our faith and to make some memories with our Perry Creek Church family. So if you would like to go with us, check out your newsletter. There will be a link in there for you to sign up. And like I said, we have 10 slots. So the first 10 get to come along. But don't worry. If all of those slots get filled, we're going to have other opportunities. The missions team is going to put together other chances for us to do that throughout the year. So read your newsletter. Um, but before we go today, we have some things to celebrate. I don't know if you know this, but January has been an incredible month of blessing for the church at Perry Creek. First of all, we had a baby. <laughs> If you haven't heard the wonderful news, Harrison Rush Maiden, and he is such a cutie. Oh, my goodness. He was born to John and Sarah and John Duke and Sadie Kate on January the 15th. That is an incredible blessing. We also have a lot of other January babies at Perry Creek Church. Kim Ledford, Kathy Starkey, Renelle Bezadenhout. Angela Limtong, Jim Salisbury, Darren Picard, Krishna and Clarissa Bezaden, Hope, Melissa Schofield, Abby Clemens, and especially Allison Brown and Sadie Kate Maiden are celebrating birthdays today. So we have lots of January birthdays, and there are probably several that I missed as well, but we want to say happy birthday to you all. We are so thankful for you. We have another thing to celebrate. We have a graduation. Adam Green is graduating from Millbrook High School, and we are just so proud of him. So congratulations, Adam. We are thankful for you as well. Well, for our benediction today, I want to read to you Romans 5, verse 8, which says this. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the simplicity and the beauty of the gospel. That is the main thing for us here at Perry Creek Church, and you are now on mission.